this morning. I said the Lord. He started me on my way. I said the Lord. I have a reason to serve you. I said the Lord. Because you died on the cross. I said the Lord. You died on the cross. I said the Lord. And you woke one morning. I said the Lord. You got up from the grave. I said the Lord. Oh, Determination today. Have you come to that conclusion today? Will you serve him? Will you bless him? Will you magnify the Lord? For he is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Yeah, I'm gonna serve him. How about you? You gonna serve the Lord? Are you gonna worship him? Are you going to bless him? Are you going to magnify his name? I've come to the conclusion that I need to serve, serve the Lord himself. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I have I've come to the conclusion that I need to serve him who blessed us beyond measure. He is, he is, he is God. Amen. Call your attention to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. I know that Sunday school teachers all over the world dealt with Joshua chapter 1 through 20 today. I want to look at verse number 27. Joshua chapter 6, verse number 27. I happen to peep in on the youth class today, and they were dramatizing it. They were marching around the city. They saw the walls recede into the earth. If you would stand for the reading of the word of God. Joshua chapter 6, verse number 27 is where we are. Joshua chapter 6, verse 27. Young folk taught me what Joshua did this morning. I'm so glad. Verse 27, when you found it, you will discover these words. So the Lord was with Joshua, yes, sir. and his fame spread it. His fame spread throughout all the country. Amen. I want to say, may the Lord be with you. May the Lord be with you. Have you ever been in the midst of a tough conflict? A conflict that you knew you couldn't handle on your own. Have you ever been into a conflict that, that you wanted God to, to bless you through? Have you ever had a situation where you couldn't fix on your own? Have you ever had a situation where the doctors had given you a bad report? Have you ever had a bill that's due and you had more bill than you had bucks? Have you ever gotten to a point in your life where life just was not all it was cracked up to be? Have you ever gotten to a point in your life where you had all laid it all out, you had all visualized it all, you had all done everything but lived it? Drop the temperature a little bit for me, Brother Miles. So when you got to that point and you realized that you were not going to make it on your own, I'm sure you didn't call on Ghostbusters. I'm sure that you bowed your head and called on the almighty God himself. Maybe I'm speaking in the past, but I need to speak in the present. Are you at that point today where you can sing the old hymn that the hymnologist said, if the Lord doesn't help me, I can't stand 
the pain. I can't stand the rain, and, and I can't make it. Are you at that point this morning where life has given you a raw deal? And I know Christians don't live around luck, but are you at the point where you are down on your luck and you can't find luck or blessings anywhere? Are you at that point this morning where it looked like God has shut up heaven? It looked like your prayers have become bouncing ping pong balls where they ricocheting off the wall and never reaching heaven. And you're wondering, God, what you doing up there? Because you're not doing it for me down here. I know, I know, I know, I know Christians don't like to admit that they got upset with God. I know you don't, don't want to admit that, God, you are not hearing me. I know you get to a point in your life where you understand that even though he's an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God, omnipresent, all-present God, he is still a sovereign God, and he knows the end before it gets there. In the text, we have the Israelites who, were, who had wandered through the wilderness. And as they wandered through the wilderness, some people died in the wilderness. And these were the unfaithful folk to God. You better be blessing God today because you're still living. If it's not the way you want it, if it has not been dealt with you and you have not been dealt a good hand, you ought to get to a point in your life where you're just thankful anyhow. Blessed of God, we are breathing. We, we didn't walk in here with oxygen. We, we didn't limp. We walked on our own. We, we didn't take two steps and had to sit down and, and take another breath. God has really blessed us. And God has really blessed the New Beginning Church in that we haven't had a lot of funerals from our church in the last 19 years. And as the pastor of the New Beginning Church, I am so thankful that God has kept some to get 90-some years old, 80-some years old, nine and 70-some years old. God has blessed this church. And God just keep on blessing us. And it's not because we are so skilled in life. It's not because we eat the right foods, because everything on the market today, whether it says organic or not, you know they put something in there to make it so big. It's not because of our exercise routine. It's not because we've been so holy so long. It's not because we got it going on. It's not because our good jobs and how much money our jobs pay. It's not because of our 401k. Because if the Congress keep messing around, you're going to mess around and your 401k will be gone. If Congress get up on the wrong side of the bed in the morning... Your social security will never be there again. If Congress get mad, if the Democrats get upset with the Republicans and the Republicans decide to vote against the Democrats and the president can't get thrust through, let me tell you, sooner or later, we all will be panhandling and asking for a nickel, a quarter, or a dollar. But thanks be to God, God has kept us. And some of you have been through some tough times and and you know and you understand that God has done so much with so little for so long that we've come to the conclusion that God can do anything with nothing at all. I, I want to tell you, you better remember God. Remember where God has brought us. Remember what God has done through us. Remember what God has done to us. Remember God. Remember that we have not gotten here on our own accord. Young people, every person in the room is standing on somebody else's shoulder. You may think that you got FUBU or whatever you wear just because you just a child that deserve it. None of us deserve anything we have. It's because of God's amazing grace. 
that we still breathe in. <laughs> it's because of God's amazing grace that, that blood is yet running warm in the internals of our body. It's because of God's amazing grace that our heart is still pumping blood to every extremity of our body. It's only because of God's amazing grace. It doesn't matter how much beauty supplies you can supply. It doesn't matter what shape you are. It doesn't matter if you come up with, with a problem here and a problem there. It is God that has kept you. And let me tell you, the ultimate thing is God can bless you now and he can bless you later. If he's blessed you with salvation, that's enough to run, rip, and clap and shout about. I want to tell you, we serve an awesome God. Matter of fact, we don't serve a awesome God. We serve the awesome God. For there is nobody like our God. You look back in previous chapters, you'll find the same God brought them out of captivity. The same God brought the Israelites out from under Pharaoh's bondage. This same God changed the sea into water. And that water turned to red blood. This same God that, that, that brought them out of Egypt. He, he put frogs in the kitchen and frogs in Pharaoh's bed. And, and he put lice all around the kingdom. This same God that they saw great miracles from. This same God is still keeping them. Regardless of what has happened. See, we have to get to a point where we understand very well that God blesses us in spite of us. So we got to remember God. Remember what God has done through us. Remember what God has done for us. Remember what God has done with us. Remember God. If you're in a tight fix right now, remember what God has already done. The Israelites walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. And God blessed them to be able to look back at the enemies and the sea closed up again. And the songwriter says Pharaoh and his army got drowned in the Red Sea. God created a paved highway in the Red Sea. The Israelites marched all night long on dry ground, and that same dry ground became a messy pool once again when God closed it up on the Egyptians. The Pharaoh that was in charge in his army got drowned in the Red Sea. The Israelites went into the wilderness, wandering around, for 40 years because of them, not because of God. It's because they lacked faith, not because God wasn't able to do it. It's because they were disobedient, not because God did not want to do it. It's because they were not consistently going before God and, and trusting into God. Matter of fact, they got out there and they decided we need another God. Aaron took their jewelry. And you know when a woman gives up her jewelry, something's wrong. Aaron took their jewelry and fashioned them a god, a calf. Fashioned them a calf, and they began to worship this god. They got mad with the leader. They got mad with the one that was talking to God. And, and Aaron and, and, and her had to hold up the leader's hand in order for them to win the battle. They got mad. They so mad at God, they rather, they rather worship a golden calf than to worship God who brought them out of Egypt. They got so mad at God. Let me tell you, that's how I know folk get mad at God. <laughs> we, can, we can get so mad at God until we don't want to worship this God anymore. He's not the one who's sustaining us anymore. But we forget that the golden calf cannot keep us. The golden calf cannot help us. But we're going to worship something other than this almighty God. They got so mad with the leader in Moses. They said, Moses, we don't want to talk to you anymore. We want God to talk to us himself. Oh, what a mistake. Oh, what a mistake that was. When God started talking, lightning started flashing. When God started talking, thunder started rolling. 
when God spoke one day, the whole earth just opened up and dropped about four, five, six, seven, eight of them in there and closed the earth back up. Lord have mercy. Now my question to you, my dears, is it the reason that, that we have vacant pews? Is it because that folk don't want to hear what the preacher has to say? They want God to talk to them himself. As the God started tearing up the place and messing up lives and, and dropping folk in the earth after God got through with it, they said, Moses, we're going to hear you. Moses, we don't want to talk to God anymore. We let you go up there and talk to your God. I'm just telling you, you got to remember where God has brought you. You got to remember what God has blessed you through. You have to remember how God has blessed you in spite of you. Even when you didn't deserve it, God just keeps right on blessing you. Because of his mercy. You see, his mercy is when God gives us the good when he ought to be giving us the bad. He doesn't give us the bad that we deserve. We ought to make sure that we give God the best of the best. We worship God and we ought to worship him in spirit and in truth. We honor God and we ought to give God our very best. We, we ought not show up on Sunday or Wednesday or whatever your worship day and say, preacher, preach to me. Preacher, make me happy. We ought not say to the choir, choir, sing me happy. We ought not say to the ushers, you didn't smile at me the right way. You ought to bring your own fire, bring your own wood, and when you walk in the door, you ought to be on fire for God, thanking him for another week, and some of us have had a hell of a week. And we ought to just thank him. Anybody, any, anybody other than me just had a rough week, I mean it. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're saved, it's okay to admit that you didn't like your week. It's all right if you're saved to admit that I had some time this week that I haven't had before, and I didn't really like what time I had before. It's all right. It's okay because you got to be honest with God because he's the sovereign God. He knows everything. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to do. He knows what you have done. There's no secret that we can hold from God. So you need to remember God. Always remember what God has done for you. Always be thankful for what God has done. The Israelites are nothing but modern day Americans. The Israelites paints a picture of modern day Americans because we are thankful to God at 9-11, but 9-12 we don't remember that God anymore. I mean, every church in the neighborhood was jam-packed. It looked like rush hour Traffic on 59 or 45. Every church, I went from one church to the other, and every church on 9-11 was down. It was jam-packed. Folk were laying prostrate at the altar, and they were calling on God. 3,000 people who have been killed in the trade center, and we think the end of the world is coming in. Don't wait till you think to the end of the world is coming that you will honor your God. I mean, that Sunday morning, Every preacher in town was happy. He had a real congregation to preach to. All the next Sunday, 25% of them gone. The following Sunday, 75% of them gone. And then reality hit the preacher. He said, now these are the real group that honor God. He was down to about 22%. Of all the folk that showed up on 9-11. And then when, when something else happened, we show up. When something else goes on, then we pray. We ought to stop using God as a fire escape. You only use the fire escape when there's a fire. <laughs> and whenever there's a fire, we call on God. We are just like the Israelites. Israelite left. They got in the wilderness, asked God for bread, God gave them bread. Asked God for meat, God gave them meat. Got to the place of where bitter water was and God made bitter water sweet. And then here we come with Joshua. You remember God promised Joshua and Caleb that they would be the two that go over. Let me tell you, the folk that died, the folk that didn't happen, have faith, the folk that demised in the wilderness is because their lack of faith. Let me tell you, the majority report is not always the best report. 
We found that out in 2016. We found out that the majority report is not always the best report. Somebody missed it. We have to understand that sometimes the minority is in touch with God. It's, it's evident in this room. It's evident online. It's evident who we, who we hang out with. It's evident that sometimes the minority has the right answer. You can't just believe the majority report because folk are going that way. Let me tell you, there is a place called hell. And hell was made for somebody. And because hell was made for somebody, we need to understand that there's a place called heaven. And heaven is a place where Jesus has prepared, a place for a prepared people. Don't follow this new age stuff that's coming out. Big Mama would say the same bridge that brought me over is the same bridge that's going to take me back. These Israelites, wandering in the wilderness, God has promised them the promised land. But let me tell you, Jericho is in the way. God made a promise. And I just want to stop right here and say not only do you remember God, you need to repeat what God has said. You need to repeat what God has said because when God makes a promise, God is obligating himself to keep his promise. God will keep his promise, so you ought to repeat what God said. Don't dream up stuff. Don't get stuff off of Google. Don't get stuff off of Wikipedia. Don't get stuff off the Internet and think that's what you ought to believe. You need to make sure that you repeat what God has said. Remember, remember what God said. Tell God what you're going through. Tell God what he promised. And there's enough right. I used to wonder as a boy, how does a preacher preach for 50 years out of 66 books, 52 times a year, sometimes two, three times a Sunday, how does he go 50 years preaching out the same book without repeating anything? Even though, even though we, have, we have talked about the same passage from time to time, every time we talk about it, it's totally different. Because God gives you a revelation. I'm telling you, revelation comes from God. <laughs> Remember where God has brought you. I'm telling you, repeat what God has said to you. And revelation only comes from God. And the revelation that he gives us is through the word of God. It's through the word. So here they are. They've gone through bitter. They have gone to a place. They're going to go later on to a place called Ai. But now they're at, Jeru at, at uh, Jericho, and at Jericho, the enemy is in the way. God is the victorious God that the enemy knows. I'm telling you, your enemy knows. Your enemy knows who your God is. The problem is Christians, Christians act like they don't know who God is. Your enemy know God. The Bible says that the enemy had heard about God. And the enemy was so afraid of their God. Until when they got to Jericho, Jericho was shut up. Jericho was bound up. Jericho had padlocks all around it. Nobody could get in and nobody could come out because Jericho was shut down. And the reason why Jericho was shut down is they had heard about that awesome God. They had heard about this God that gave victory. They had heard about this God that, that was able to do great things. I want to stop and tell you that the God we serve can do everything with nothing at all. We got to remember him. We got to repeat from him. We got to realize his revelation is available and he can do everything with nothing at all. How you say that? Because Genesis record says the earth was null and void. There was darkness upon the deep. There was no light there. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he didn't have to fashion it. God just spoke and lights came skipping through the universe. It's because God is God and he's not a man. He's God. The same God that scooped down into the dust of the earth. He scooped down into the dust. He didn't even use good dirt. He scoops down into the dust of the earth and created a whole man. The same God that took Adam's rib and created a whole woman. 
Oh, he created a whole full-grown woman. She wasn't a baby. She was, she was full-grown. He created a full-grown woman. And ever since Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, now we got to go. Women got to go through pain. And men have to go through work. And that's why I know every man ought to work. Every man, every man. You see sisters just, just loan their car out. They just give it to them. And, and then they drive up late picking them up. And, and you better not say nothing to that rascal. We understand. We have to understand. God has a plan for our life. He has a wonderful plan for our life. And our plan must be one that we walk in faith. We have to walk in faith. We have to walk in faith. Now let me tell you. God has and God will use the ungodly to bless us when the spies the spies went in that was Rahab the prostitute and that's why you can't be bad on prostitute because at least one helped us out that was Rahab the prostitute she hid the spies so they could be safe and God didn't forget about her. The men didn't forget about her. God has a way of using the ungodly to bless his people. God will use the ungodly to get his message over. That's why you can't be turning your nose down on people because you don't know who God going to use to bless you next. That's how I hug everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm in tune with everybody. If, if, if they're on this level, I talk on that level. If they're down here in the gutter, I get down in the gutter too. Because it may be that person in the gutter that comes across when you need him or her the most. Let me tell you, when you're going through something, you don't need a friend that's going to walk out on you. You need somebody that God will use and manipulate the situation just on your behalf. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, sometimes God casts and sometimes God will use the ungodly to bless you. And we need to make sure that God is blessing us when we need it. You got to walk with faith in him. God has a way of using the Ahab of our lives. God has a way of blessing the dope dealers in our lives. God has a way of using folk, and he turned their mind around. He turned their hearts around just for you. Uses, he, uses, he uses the ungodly to be a blessing to us. How many times you passed by them because they didn't have the rags you have on? How many times you ignored them because they weren't as polished as you? You are. How many times that you had your English in place and they didn't have theirs in place and you looked down on them? Let me share with you. God has a way of using folk for your betterment when you're doing bad. Thank God that God has a way of bringing things around. I keep telling people the table is always around and every now and then God will bring it around. In, in our hearing in devotion today, uh, in our, our hearing, brother, brother Hopper read, he says that God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies you better get it right with your enemies because God is trying to use them to bless you God specializes in doing the impossible God specializes in doing the impossible the Bible says and the songwriter declares that he will do with no other power Holy Ghost power he will do what no other power can do you have to understand that God specializes in your situation. You're not the first person and you will never be the last person who comes about in your situation and God just pulls you out. God knows how to get the glory, doesn't he? He, he let the doctor say what he has to say. He let the doctor say what she has to say. He let the doctor say whatever. When you want to hear from God, he, God allows the doctor to say what they have said with, according to their expertise. And you ought to go to the doctor. You ought to get the news from the doctor. You ought to hear what the doctor has to say. But I'm telling you, God specializes in doing the impossible. He will do what no other power can do. Holy Ghost. Power. He can do what no other power can do, and he doesn't have to take a whole long time to do it. 
You see, we have to be faithful to God. We have to be obedient to God. We have to walk with God because this is the fact of the matter. Sometimes God calms the storm. Whenever his child is in a storm, sometimes God calms the storm. You remember how Jesus stood up? The waves were over 15 feet high. The wind was blowing and howling, acting a fool, and the people were scared. They woke Jesus up. Jesus stands up and talks to the wind. He talks to the waves and says, peace be still. And the waves laid down and slept like a baby. The wind stopped howling. And there was a calm that came over the sea. Oh, we love that. We love the fact that God can stand and God can speak. And when God stands and speaks, God has a way of blessing us. Regardless of who we are, God has a way of blessing us. Oh, we like when God just says, peace be still, and the waves shut up. And we can brag about how God blesses us. We can brag about how God keeps us. We can brag about how God shut the wind and the waves down. We brag about that. But sometimes God allow the winds and the waves to keep on blowing. Sometimes he doesn't shut the winds and the waves down when we talk to him. Sometimes God allow the winds and the waves to just Keep on going. It's those times that God doesn't calm the storm. It's those times that God calms the child in the midst of the storm. It's all right when God chooses to calm the storm. It's a good thing when God shut it down. And when God shut it down, we don't have to deal with it anymore. Some of you have been bitten by diseases. And, and those diseases have taken you around or to in some things. But let me tell you, when God shuts it down, you ought to brag about it. You ought to tell somebody about it. The enemy ought to know about who God is and what God has already done. The enemy ought to know how God has kept you. The enemy ought to know how God has brought you. But let me tell you, it's just as important when you're still going through to keep trusting God. Let me share with you, every Wednesday night, every Tuesday night, every Monday night, every Thursday night, and every Sunday morning, and every Saturday, I'm depending on God to do some things that he's never done in my life. And you can't stop testifying of the goodness of God because you're going through. The fact of the matter is you're going through. And as you go through, you need to understand that God is with you. That's why, that's why I can stand when my situation is not over. When I'm hurting. When I'm going through. When things are going bad. I can still tell you to trust in God and watch what God is doing. Even when I'm going through the very thing that I'm asking God to fix, I still have to believe who God is. Let me tell you, whenever I'm sick, I'm still believing that God is a medicine. He is the one who heals us. I'm still believing when, when life is going on and, and life is giving me a, a raw deal, I'm still believing that God is a way out of no way. When things are not going right, when I'm lost in my condition, I'm still believing that God is my GPS that gives me direction. And let me tell you, you got to stand on the word when things ain't working for you. You got to stand on the word when, when, when life is bad and you know you don't have it going on. You need to act like you got it going on. You, it, it, was, it was a year and a half after I got dumped off here in Houston, Texas. Came at that time, Indianola, Mississippi was 12,000 people. I jumped into an atmosphere that was 3 million people. January 1985, 22 years old, no family here. Got some buddies that graduated from high school with me. I couldn't even find them after I got here. A year and a half later, after I took my job, they laid me off. I got laid off and I felt it was wrong because there was another guy who came in after me, but I couldn't dwell on that. Let me tell you, don't dwell on the mishap. Don't dwell on who's doing you wrong. Just make sure you understand that God is in the process. You got to go through the process. You got to go through the process. And God put me in the midst of a church that was feeding my soul, a church that people would concluded that I was a part of the family, a church that welcomed me in, and it was that church that nourished me. 
as I was going through. In the, in the meantime, I go to interviews. And as I went to interviews, boy, I was dressed to the hilt. I was walking downtown when I went to the interview for the city of Houston. I'm walking downtown. I had my tie ready. I was laid. I had that one suit that I brought from home that I wore to every interview. <laughs> every interview, I, was, I picked the sharpest suit I could find. It was very conservative suit. But when I was walking downtown, I had my, my shoulders back. I was taking long strides. I had my head up. And folk thought I was one of the lawyers there. And they, they thought I was doing fine. And I was broken in Job's turkey. I had no money in my pocket. But I was acting like I was rich. I was carrying myself like I was rich. And I knew I was going to find a job sooner or later. I had doors shut in my face. During that time, you didn't fill out an application on the internet. You had to go into the interview and sell yourself. And guess what? They, they laughed about me being so dressed. They said, you know, this is the turn of the 80s. We're wearing collars now, but we're not wearing coats. We, this is the turn of the 80s, and, and we're not wearing dressed up suits anymore. I said to them every single time, I said, yeah, but one thing I do know, after I leave here, you will remember that I was the man with the suit on. You're going to forget everybody else that comes in with a, with a tie, without a, without a tie on. You're going to remember I'm the guy with the suit. I'm the guy with to shine shoes because God opened doors. When you broke, you ought to act like you got money. You, you ought to trust God like you got money. Let me tell you, you can't, you can't stop trusting God just because he hadn't delivered when you thought he should deliver. You need to act like you got what God got to give and you ought to act like the God you serve is going to finally see what's going on. Stop worrying about other folk and how they getting blessed. The God we serve, the God we serve, he can bless us and just because he blessed somebody with a new car, that's nothing for God. He's a bigger God than that. And don't get jealous when somebody else get blessed in your neighborhood because that means God is stopping by the neighborhood. The God that's all places at the same time anyway. He is stopping by the neighborhood. You ought to rejoice with them. You ought to celebrate with them. You ought to act a fool unto the Lord for them. Because somebody in your neighborhood got blessed. It's a terrible thing when brothers and sisters uh, create a rivalry where, where they're jealous when one, one another get blessed. I mean, did, you, you got that and, and God blessed you. Why God didn't bless me? Well, it ain't your time yet. God is using what he has before you, every circumstance, to build your faith up in him. But God, I didn't do anything to deserve this. That's all right. You'll be able to tell somebody else what you went through in five years, and you can do it in five minutes to tell them how to be blessed of God. God is using you. God is blessing you, and God is specializing in blessing you. God promised the children of Israel the promised land and the God we serve will always be obedient to his own self. The God we serve will always be obedient to him, him own self. Not only that, the God we serve will always keep his promise. The God we serve is going to keep his promise. You tried her and she didn't keep that one. You tried him. You know, when I grew up, I don't know if they do it anymore. Boy would give a girl a promise ring. And he promised to be only hers. She gave him a promise ring, and she promised to only be his. Now, see, in, in the backwoods of Mississippi, we couldn't afford a promise ring. If I came to Dad and talking about buying a girl a promise ring at 17, he said, boy, you better go get some wheat and some bread. You better go get some corn flakes or something. You put your money down on that. So, so what we did, what we did, we, we, bought, we bought a class ring. And we would get a class ring, and we would give it to the little girl. A whole $50 class ring that mama has raped and straped. Daddy has dealt with bad supervisors and bad people on his job. And we're going to take that $50 class ring, and when the girl comes over to visit, she got our class ring on a rope around her neck. You may do it one time. But the next time she come over, 
that class ring gonna be on your finger and it's gonna be stuck on that finger because we don't have any money to give anybody and we can't afford. I'm calling myself promising myself to somebody. I'm gonna take the class ring that daddy has worked in the fields for, that daddy has gotten, he comes home looking like a dust monster. You can only see his eyes and his teeth. Daddy, daddy's a sharecropper and I call myself gonna give his $50 ring to some girl talking about I'm promising something to you. I mean, that was a family meeting where all of my brothers and sisters behind me knew not to make that mistake again. $50, Brother Miles. 1981, 50 whole dollars. And Jeanette walks in with my class ring round her neck. That never happened again. It never will happen again. Tell me, this my girl. You ain't got no girl. You ain't old enough to have a girl. That ain't your girl. Well, we have to understand God keeps his promise and he doesn't have to have a promise ring. God has God's word and God will keep his promise. If God said we're going into the promised land, we're going into the promised land. Jesus says, meet me in, in Galilee. They're going to meet in Galilee. If Jesus says that I'm going to serve communion with you, even after, after I leave here, I'm going to serve it again over, over, over on the other side, Jesus is going to serve communion with us. God keeps God's promises. God delivers on his promise. Jericho is shut up. Jericho is locked down. No one can get in and no one can get out. And because they can't get in, it's going to be hard for the Israelites to get in to the promised land that God has promised them. Let me share with you, just because God promised you doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Just because God promised you doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I'm so sick and tired of couples that say God gave me this husband and they're so excited. They're so, so overjoyed and they're so in love. And then you want to roll over one day and say, I think I miss God. I don't think God really told me you are supposed to be my husband. God honors your choices. Whatever choice. Sister Davis has made a choice. And Sister Davis, Brother Carter, she's having to deal with her choice. <laughs> All of me, she's having to deal with it. She made her choice. She's made her choice. Sister Hopper, Sister Davis has made her choice. And this is what she got. This is what she has to deal with. 24-7. Same old dude. Country boy, backwoods of Mississippi, she's made her choice. Now, she can't wake up in the morning and tell me that God told me that you should not have been my choice. Well, baby, you made your choice 24 years ago. <laughs> and I'm not saying you stuck. You can still get up and make a different choice. But the fact of the matter is you have made a decision. God honors your decision. And because God honors your decision, you need to make the best of your decision. So every now and then, uh, if Sister Davis has a complaint with me, Sister Paul, I tell her, it's your decision. <laughs> I didn't make the decision. You made the decision. You stuck with it. It's your decision. <laughs> Therefore, you don't talk bad about your decision. You, you can't talk bad about your decision. Because the fact of the matter is, you made the decision. You made, and it was a clean cut decision. It was no forcing. There was no, no parental guidance. She was so excited that day, I kneeled down on one knee in front of her whole family. I spent 20 minutes with her daddy, and I made him a Promise, I, Sister Trejo, I made, I made her, I made, I made him a promise. I said, if you allow me to have her today, you would never have to worry about her ever again. All of 20 minutes. 
Then I walked over, and they were cleaning up the fellowship hall after the recital at her mama's a mama's church, they, they were cleaning up the fellowship hall, and you know when folk really clean and they take the shoes off. I call attention to the whole family. Some of them had just met me the first time. They've already done their, their 10,000 family meetings. They've already talked bad about me. They've already seen me from can to can because I didn't, I didn't hide anything. And then I kneeled down on one knee. She started scrambling around and had a, had a royal blue dress on that night. And she was about 20 pounds lighter that night. I got down on one knee, and she started running. Where are my shoes? Where are my shoes? I can't be proposed to with no shoes on. And I asked in front of the whole family, Sister Davis Davis, and she said yes. She was just so excited. She didn't even want to go home that night. I, we just riding around the city. Police wondering why y'all just riding around like this. We just riding. She didn't even want to go home. Uh, but see, she didn't even want to go home that night. I said, girl, I need to take you home so I won't mess up with your daddy before I get started. <laughs> so she can't, she can't have any of y'all ever heard her talk bad about me? Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. It's a choice that she made. New Beginning made a choice of me. September 7, 2004, New Beginning made a choice of me. I'm the same guy I was then, just about 20 pounds heavier <laughs> and 10 pounds lighter in the head because they made a choice of me. So, so here you got what you got. You just got what you got, Sister Henry. You got what you got. What I mean, I'm just tearing up English this morning. You, what you have to understand is God honors your desires. God honors your choices. And if since you you have made a choice, stay with the Lord. May the Lord be with you. Stay with the Lord. Watch what the Lord can do. Cause God does great things if you just honor Him. The Bible says they, they got to Jericho. The walls were standing there. They walked around the city for six days. They walked around the city first day, one time, went home. Walked around the city the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth day, went home. Now let me tell you, if these had been some New Beginning Church members, I wonder if you would have walked around the city and been obedient. The Bible says, say nothing. Keep quiet. Don't be talking. Watch what God is going to do. And then you may get up the first day and you say, what is this bald head man talking about? <laughs> By the time you get to the third day, I ain't going out there anymore. <laughs> nothing is happening. We hadn't gotten in the city because they didn't know what God is going to do. Let me tell you, it's up to the leader to know that God can and God will answer. Right, right. The Bible says that God showed his, his ways to Moses and gave his, his mighty acts before the children of Israel. In other words, God showed the leader who God was. The leader has to understand how God operates. And when it doesn't make sense, you just keep right on being obedient. You just keep marching. You just keep walking. You, you just keep moving around the city because God is up to something behind the scene. Now, who, who thought it would make sense to walk around the city? A city with walls there. A city that no one else can get in. And you're just walking around the city. They did it six days, once a day. And on the seventh day, people really, really at the New Beginning Church would have been like, seven whole days, and now you're asking us to do seven times. <laughs> Girl, you know that ain't right. That joke ain't been with the Lord. He's just coming up with stuff. Now, what difference is going to make with us walking around this city, the same city we walked around six times on six different days, now he want us to walk around it seven times on the seventh day, and then he had the nerve to say we ought to shout. <laughs> the Bible says that they walked around the city on the seventh day, seven times, 
and shout. Brother Whitlock said it like this. He says that you ought to raise your voice. A shout is something that we ought to do. We ought to, we ought to rejoice. Brother Whitlock said you ought not wait till the battle is over. You ought to be shouting right now. You, you ought to be celebrating what God is going to do. You ought to be celebrating what God is doing. You ought to be celebrating what God can't, you can't see right now. And you ought to be celebrating instead of talking about what God has not done. And on the seventh time, on the seventh day, historians said that the wall receded into the ground. The Bible says that the walls fell down. This word falling down, the walls didn't lay down like we know it. The walls receded into the ground. Let me tell you, when God opens up the ground and shut down whole walls, walls that are stopping things from being blessed, walls that are hindering you from walking with God, when God receded those walls in the ground, he's saying, I'm burying these walls. What has God buried in your life that you keep trying to dig up? What has God gotten rid of or who has God gotten rid of that you keep digging it back up? You keep going back. You got a shovel, a dipper, and a bucket out there. You've gone and rented a whole combine tractor. You got you a caterpillar and a John Deere, and you out there digging up the walls that God has removed from your life. What has God taken out of the way of your blessing that you still trying to go back and dig up? What people have God moved? What headaches have God removed from you and you still want it? Oh, that, that, he just make me feel so good, girl. And God done put him out your way. He, God has taken you out your miseries. Second Peter says it like this, Second Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Second Peter says it like this, he compares a dog and a hog. He says that, that you would have been better had you not known the way of righteousness. Then to know the way of righteousness and go back to it. First of all, he says a hog, a hog goes back to the mud that he has been washed from. He keep going right back to the mud. And then, and then he talks about the dog, Sister Whitlock. And when he talks about the dog, Brother Whitlock, he says the dog has gone back to his own vomit again. In other words, the dog eat good food. The dog eat good feeling food. The dog eat food that he likes. And all of a sudden it goes down into his intestines and he brings it back up. And because he liked it when it went down, he goes back and lick up on the vomit that God has washed him from. Somebody said, man, Pastor David's just nasty. <laughs> Sister Hopper, you ought to see your face right now, Sister Hopper. You are, Sister Hopper, you about to leave that seat right now, Sister Hopper. You, Sister Hopper said, that's a nasty preacher. But look at, look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Read the whole thing for content. The Bible says that you go back like a dog and lick up on your own vomit. What he's saying is the sin that God has watched you from, the sin that God has brought you from, he, you go back and eat it again and again and again. And God just has favor and he keeps blessing us and saying, my child, don't do it anymore. Don't do it. I forgive you. We don't have to force the walls to come down. We don't have to make the walls to come down. We don't have to lie for the wall to come down. God already has some lying folk in place for us. You don't have to lie. You don't have to lie to make the walls come down. Ahab was already out of connection with God. God used a prostitute who was already out of the ark of safety to, in order to get into the ark of safety. She did lie. God told me one time, he said, preacher, I know, I know that fellow there giving you problems, but you need to stay clean. Let me handle him. He says, he says preacher, don't you get involved in a dispute with him. Don't you get involved with, 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 with cutting him. I'm good at cutting him, preacher. You stay clean, preacher. Don't, don't you get involved. In, and then uh, Ronnie Matthews said, we are, every pastor ought to have a cusser ministry. Every pastor ought to have a cussing ministry. They ought to have somebody that's, that's elevated to lead the cussing ministry. What's your job? Your job, your job is to be the servant leader over the cussing ministry. 
So the pastor doesn't have to cuss. Just call on the cussing ministry. So when I don't want to cuss, I just say, Sister Brown, come take care of my, my lightweight for me. <laughs> say, come on, come, I got a little lightweight over here I need you to take care of. And y'all say, Sister Brown ain't like that. She, she's very quiet. That's the ones you want to watch. Sister Irvin, I got a problem over here. Sister Irvin, come take care of him. Come on, take care of him. Big Papa Irvin, I need you to go take care of that one. And then he'll be rushing. Where is he? <laughs> I'm telling you, God has some people in place where you don't have to force it. You don't have to take care of it. God has a way of blessing you, and, and he has a way of blessing you through other people. Oh, yeah, I'm friends with some folk. There's one brother that, 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 that hang out with me, and, and I won't tell you how he's hanging out. He, he'd tell me in a heartbeat, now, nah, he just need a good cussing out, Reverend. You ride on up there. You go on, over, go on up there, Reverend. I'll take care of this business back here. Matter of fact, ride about a mile up there because it may get loud. <laughs> you don't have to force it. Godly success is in the hands of the Lord. Godly success is in the hands of the Lord. And because godly success is in the hands of the Lord, you make sure you stay with God. You make sure you walk with God. You make sure that God is on your heart and God is walking with you and you walking with God because godly success is in the Lord's hand. When a person rejects you, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. And when you need, when you need, when you need somebody to be there with you, let me tell you, we all need friends. We need, we need good friends and we need bad friends. We need good friends and we need bad friends. I mean, you don't hang out to the point where you do whatever they do. But the fact of the matter is you got to hang out with them so that they can do what they do and they do it unashamedly. And you bless them and they bless you. Brother Miles, how many friends you got like that? Brother Miles <laughs> said, don't worry about it. I got somebody, Pastor David. Just, just hold your hope. They, they grew up in church with me, but the church was never in them. <laughs> while the walls are still in place, while the walls are still standing strong, you need to believe that God has the battle. While the walls are still in place, while the walls are still standing strong, you need to believe that God got these things handled. Misery, God can handle it. Lack of success, God can handle it. Unemployment, God can handle it. Frustration, God can handle it. Bipolarism, God can handle it. You need to take it before God. And when you trust in God, God can handle it. There are three things that we need to remember. Number one, we need to know that we have faith in God. You need to check your faith meter. Check what you believe. Check how you believe it. And God doesn't have to give us any more than we already have in order to have faith in him. You need to check your faith meter. Faith in God takes us to another dimension. Faith in God takes us on another plane. Faith in God takes us where we've never been. When you walk with God, God will walk with you. Faith in God will take you where you've never been. Elevate your faith. And the only way to elevate your faith is through the word of God. That's why we're listening to the word. That's why we're reading the word. That's why we're studying the word. Guess what we're going to do next year? We're going to study the word. We're going to read the word. We're going to talk with God. We're going to tell God about it. Because faith in God takes us to another level. Remember where God's brought you. God brought you a mighty long way. I don't care what situation you're in now. God has brought you there. The next thing is God has done with us more than we can do for ourselves. God has done with us. How many people, you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to look to the side. How many people have gotten to a point where you almost lost your mind? And you knew just, a, just another tweak, just another statement, just another movement, you would be out of here. That's why I ask people sometimes, you taking your medication today? Look like you need to go and take it now because medication may be good for you. 
But you have to under, understand too that God has a way of blessing you. The word of God is medicine to our souls. It's medicine to our flesh. It's the word of God. And as the word of God blesses us, we keep studying the word of God. And as we keep studying the word of God, God keeps delivering us from whatever we are going through. The next thing you got to do is be obedient. Obedience opened doors for God's blessings. They walked around. They were obedient. They didn't talk. They kept walking. They didn't talk. They kept walking. You have to be obedient. Obedience opened doors to God's blessing. Obey when God tells you what God has to do. Obey what God tells you to do. Always be obedient. Don't be so quick to say, no, nah, that ain't me. I ain't doing that. Be obedient. If there's leadership in place, follow leadership. Be obedient. I always tell people I am ultimately responsible for this church. Ultimately. If I'm out of town, Deacon Afford, Deacon Afford is not responsible. I am ultimately responsible. If things go wrong, I take on that responsibility. 600, 1,200, 2,000 miles away, I am ultimately responsible. I am responsible, and I take on that responsibility because God has a way of blessing us through obedience. That's why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. The reverse is that's true. As I do not follow Christ, you're not obligated to follow me. Now, it didn't say condemn me and kick it out. Now, come on. But it says, follow me as I follow Christ. The third thing is persistency. It simply means do it over and over and over again. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. It may not make sense. Just keep doing it. Keep trusting God. It, it may not be working right now, but keep trusting God. It may not have hit you yet, but keep trusting God. Do it over and over. Be persistent. Be persistent. You need to spend time with some things. God is doing some things behind the scene with you that you don't even know about. But he wants you to Trust him. He wants you to walk in faith with him. He wants you to be obedient, and he wants you to be persistent. Do it over and over again. That's why folk come to church on Sunday. They do it over and over again. That's why folk ain't lying because I don't want to go out there to the church because COVID may. They act like we manufacturing COVID at the church. But they were at Beyonce. They were at the Texans. They were at the Astros. I mean, you got people rooting for the Astros that never played baseball. Don't have a sports bone. Matter of fact, they don't know what a double play is. They don't know why they get first downs. But they, they will get out there and they will do, do tailgating and, and everything. But when you are persistent about God, you telling God, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And you, come, you become like Jacob and you tell God, you may get out of here, but you won't get out of here without a blessing. That's why we have to pray and fast and watch what God does. And if it doesn't work that time, pray and fast and watch what God does. If it doesn't work that time, we pray and we fast and watch what God does. And as we pray and fast, God is doing something within us that will show up outside of us. Be faithful to him. Trust him. May God be with you. And when God is with you, mountains are moved. When God is with you, walls come tumbling down. When God is with you, your enemies will know your God. <laughs> when God is with you, God prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. You just put your long flowing dress on. You put your high heels on. You just look your best because God is using your enemies to bless you. That's what Jesus did. Jesus made sure that his enemies were afraid of him. He didn't brag about it, but they had heard about Jesus. And they thought he was coming to take over the kingdom. Jesus doesn't want an earthly kingdom. He wants you to be a part of his heavenly kingdom. Jesus Christ came and, and Herod showed up and Herod wanted to kill him off. And he killed a lot of other folk in order to get to Jesus. Jesus gave his life for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus was buried for you. And Jesus rose from the dead for you. 
And because he got up from the dead, we can live. The songwriter declares, I know he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lived. Yes, he lived. He's one who lived. He got up early that third day morning, rose from the dead. He folded his napkin right well. He didn't throw it in the plate. He didn't throw it in the tomb. He folded up right well. He, he folded and made a neat napkin and, and put it where his head was laying. What he was saying is, I'm leaving now, but I'm coming back again. I'm going to a place to make you a mansion. It's going to be just your style. I'm coming back. One of these days, the same Jesus that died on Calvary. One of these days, the same Jesus that rose early that third day morning. One of these days, the same Jesus that caught a cloud and got out of here. One of these old days, the same Jesus that makes intercession for us. He's going to catch a cloud. He's going to ride back in here. He's going to stop in midair. The dead in Christ shall rise. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him. And we will forever be with the Lord. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be with you. One of these old days, I'm going to be on the other side. Crying, holy, holy, holy. Blessed is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. This is my prayer. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus right now while you got time. Come to Jesus because he's the one who can help you. Come to Jesus. He makes a way out of no way. The door is open. The door is open. He will. He will. He'll make your life brand new. Make your life brand new. Come to Jesus. The door is open. Have you tried him? Won't he do it? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Wow. Come to Jesus. Just knowing Jesus. Just knowing Jesus. It, it, it has made a difference. It has made a difference. And it has really paid off. Come on, come on, come on to Jesus.